Good evening and welcome to another Awaka Fireside Chat. I'm Carolyn Porta. I'm a professor in nursing and I'm an associate vice president here at the University of Minnesota in the Office of Academic Clinical Affairs. I'm delighted to host a fireside chat, a conversation that's informal, candid, meant to really understand a bit more about the lives of experts in your respective fields and really the current generation of, of researchers and healthcare professionals um, giving advice to and encouraging the next generation that's coming up. So welcome to the interns and the scholars that are here with us on Zoom this, uh, this evening and welcome to our guests, um, Dr. Sherry Friedrich and Dr. Damian Fair. I'd like to open us up and uh, kick us off with brief introductions and simply ask you to tell us a little bit about yourself and a little bit about uh, your journey to where you are right now. Not, not the whole story because we'll probably get into some of that as we, as we go through the next little bit of time. Sherry, would you get us started? Sure, I'll happily get, you, get us started. So I'm a pediatric nurse practitioner by training and have been practicing um, since the mid 90s. I still maintain a practice today in a federally qualified healthcare center for a few hours a week to keep my toes in the water. Um, I have taught at the University of Minnesota since I was young in 1992. I was fresh out of, um, not too far out of my undergrad and had been working on a master's degree and they asked me to teach a clinical section of students and um, voila, I never thought I would fall in love with academia and I've basically been here ever since. I took a little time off in the um, early 2000s to be home with my littles at the time um, who are now in their 20s um, and so really have um, kind of been here a, a long time. I did most of my degrees here at the University of Minnesota except for my nurse practitioner training which I did at the College of St. Catharines. Um, finished my master's here and my doctorate of nursing practice. Currently I am a clinical professor here in the, in the School of Nursing, and I direct the Pediatric Nurse Practitioner Program. And I have fallen in love with the world of interprofessional education, um, having practiced in that arena for many, many, many years, um, but really working on developing curriculum and um, programming around student learners and um, meeting the needs of patients and populations. And I'm currently the co-director of one of the co-directors of the Center for Interprofessional Health, which we just launched this past September. So it's an exciting um, new change here at the University of Minnesota. So that's kind of the short version of, of why I'm here and who I am. Thank you, Sherry and Damien, welcome. Hello, everybody. So I'm Damien Fair. I'm a, I'm a cognitive neuroscientist. And I'm, I'm actually now here, the, the new, co-director of the Masonic Institute for the Developing Brain. I can talk a little bit more about what all that is. Uh, I have been you know, all over the place. I'm actually originally from Minnesota, Winona, Minnesota. Uh, I left there in high school um, and did my undergrad at Augustana College in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, where I played basketball. My first stint of graduate school after, after college was actually becoming a physician assistant you know, so I was a physician assistant and at, uh, did my degree at Yale, Yale, and then I had practiced there at Yale New Haven Hospital for a couple of years before going back to get my PhD in, neuro, in neuroscience. Um, from there, I ended up in, in, as, my, as a postdoc scientist in, in Portland, Oregon at Oregon Health and Science University. I spent a little bit of time in Ethiopia, actually, it's a long story, but with my wife, who's now here as the, the uh, director of women's global health at the university. Um, but I ended up in my postdoc and started my career as a scientist in the lab at, at, at Oregon Health and Science University. And then I always had a dream of, of you know, taking my science and making sure to figuring out ways to apply it to back into clinical practice and into policy and education and things like that. I learned very early on that uh, that is a lot harder. It's a lot, it's a lot harder to do than it is to say, <laughs> and and so I found myself back, you know, in my essentially mid career, back here to start this new institute called the called MIDB or the Masonic Institute for Developing Brain, to kind of bring together a lot of 
different types of disciplines from um, psychology to neuroscientists to clinical practitioners to educators and um, community organizers and, and um, folks who do community outreach and policy makers and bringing them under all one big roof so that we can be a lot more efficient in the way that our science gets into, into the hands of the people that we're trying to reach, but also um, getting feedback, you know, from the community and from folks in the community about what are the kind of the most important questions to be asking for our science. And so now I've been here for, since I mean, they pulled me back to Minnesota you know, for all the, about 25 years, you know, I got here in 2020 and I've been here kind of working on this institute since, um, since then. Thanks, Damien, and thank you, Sherry. We have quite a few interns that are in public health, in the School of Public Health, looking at careers in administration. Both of you have been frontline healthcare professionals and you've done scholarship and research and discovery. Where, where does public health intersect with the work you've been doing? Where do you see some points of synergy? You want, okay, I can I can start. Well, what I would say is that my my work has has a lot of a ton of intersections with with public with public health. I mean, um, on in in some sense, there are there's a lot of uh, a lot of areas of discovery that we have at our disposal that has a lot of it can inform different aspects of policy, which really inform a lot of aspects of, of public health. A lot of the difficulty in that is usually that translation between somebody like me, who's a scientist and getting that into, into the hands and in, in, a, in a digestible way for a policymaker who unfortunately often are not scientists in, anymore in, or in, in clinicians like they used to be. I'm not always, but it's, it's becoming less. Um, we do a lot of, we, we have a lot of work in trying to think through public health in the, in the form of, of, of how you, we can change um, certain types of um, policy and environmental, environmental um, um, kind of principles that can affect long-term health of our population that's different than kind of trying to fix something that you, this is typically kind of the medical model, you know, which we, we think about in medicine. So we do a lot of work around that. Um, a lot of our sciences are, a lot of our science requires, you know, really smart public health officials to figure out how to do these very, very large um, studies that are aimed at specific public health types of policies. Like for example, we have the brand new study called the Healthy Brain and Child Development Study. It's where we're um, collecting, what, about a $350 million project of collecting data across the entire country from moms and infants and following those, those, so those offspring for the next 10 or 15 years. Um, we need to work with lots of public health officials to make sure that we're sampling and figuring out you know, repre you know, the represent representative samples of like big studies like this to make sure that, that the way that these studies actually inform uh, you know, pub, you know, public health and various types of policies are, rep you know, truly representative. That's actually turns out to be a very difficult task. And usually we, we lean on a lot of our, you know, public, you know, public health experts to help us do that the right way. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of, lots of different ways that the, the work that I do today, you know, actually in a quite a, you know, intersect with public health quite a bit. Thanks, Steve. I would agree. In it, policy is certainly huge in the world of pediatrics, and he mentioned some of them of the developing brain. But I think for me, my work, the 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 synergies, the synergy really comes in clinical practice, right? So anytime you're in a clinical environment and you're working with a population, for me, pediatrics, um, you see the needs of the community as a whole and what the needs of that community are. And thinking from a public health perspective, how do I meet the needs of more than just the patient who's sitting with me at the edge of the bed? Um, and I work in an FQHC, as I said, and so we have a population of uninsured and underserved families who have a lot of social determinants of health 
um, risk factors. And so what policies will impact that, but then also what kind of things can we, what kind of systems can we even put in place in the clinic to really meet the needs of the community? And so really every time you're in clinic, there's, a, there's this community health focus, um, public health focus as you're looking at meeting the needs of, of more than just one. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate um, both of those perspectives and some of those specific examples. Um, let's get personal for a minute. I'll come back to social and structural determinants of health um, if I feel like it. What brings you joy these days? Damien? Oh, well, you know, getting outside is, always gives me, <laughs> you know, gives me lots of joy. Um, no, I, you know, I have, um, of course, I spend a lot of time and been doing, you know, do a lot of activities with my with my kids and my family, you know, yeah. um, and so that always brings me lots of joy. Sometimes that intersects with other aspects of my career that gives me that also gives me lots of joy. I mean, I really, really love what I do. <laughs> I talk about um, how, you know, particularly when I'm doing a lot of mentoring, I mentor a lot of students, and um, I, I I often advise folks to particularly when they're particularly young to kind of not assume you, you know what you want to do, but really kind of sample the landscape. And if you're really lucky, you'll be able to find some, something that captures your attention that you just got to do it. You know, you just really, really, really love it. And it's probably one of the best gifts you can have in a lifetime is to be able to have your career be something you love so much. Um, and it's not, you can't take it for granted because it's not always, that does, that is not always the case. In fact, it's probably unfortunately rarer than, than it should be. So I really love my job. You know, I really spent a lot of, I literally spent a lot of time and love hanging out with my, my family. And right now, for the first time in a, about 18 years, I really like watching the Timberwolves. So that's like, the, <laughs> <laughs> that's like the last, you know, my last little bit of joy right now. Let's hope that doesn't jinx them at all. <laughs> <laughs> Sherry, how about you? What brings you joy? Oh my gosh, so many things. Damien, I love what you said about finding joy in your work. I, I love I love what I do. I get so much joy from my colleagues having lunch with them, um, my students, um, mentoring them and watching them grow um, and developing relationships with them that have continued for years in really meaningful personal ways just really makes me smile. And so also like you, Damien, feeling super grateful that I have um, that connection. Um, my kids, however, they're in their twenties and they would say, that's a lot of pressure, mom. Not everyone can just love their job as much as you and dad do. Um, so all, their whole growing up, I'm like, find something you love that you're passionate about. And, um, and they're working on it, I think. So I, I send the same message, but I think in some ways it's a little, not everyone finds it like you say. And so, but I have found it. And so I'm um, joy in what I do for sure. Simple joys, being outside, having a window in my office, um, any, anytime I can hike a mountain brings me great joy. And I also have the need for speed. Um, and so anything I can get on something fast, um, makes me smile to no end. And, um, we just purchased a new, we live on a lake. We purchased a new little toy, a jet <laughs> ski that goes way faster than I probably should take it. Um, and we are all, my children happen to be home still for the Easter holiday. And we're all just like, is it 50? Can we put it in right now? Mom will feel really stress-free if she just goes zoom, zoom two times. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Gosh, it's got me thinking. And hopefully those of you listening as well, what brings you joy? And uh, have you tapped into that recently? And if you haven't, why not? We need to be really on a daily basis. And I do hope that folks are inspired to not settle, but to truly find work that does bring satisfaction and joy. It's, it's worth the journey to get there. Let's take a step back and put yourself in the shoes of your 20 something um, human, human. Would you think about and just reflect and share for, for the group here, share anything that you would make sure you did again share anything that you would do differently if if anything in either of those categories jumps to mind what would you make sure you did what would you make sure you wouldn't do if anything i'll jump in i would say don't be afraid to jump in take a chance do something that you think hmm, i don't know if that's for me um 
when they asked me to be part of the One Health team to develop a professional curriculum, I'm like, mm, I don't know, do I really want to do that? Um, but a door opened and I took a step and it was really life-changing in so many ways for me. It grew my scholarship in ways that I never thought I would. Um, and so just taking a chance when, take a chance when you think it maybe is not the right thing. Um, you can always go back, but you, you can't, if the door opens, it might close. Um, so that would be one thing. Um, just the joy of learning. Never, never, never turn your back on the joy of learning. I think um, I've always really loved to learn. And I think I did that well. And I just kept my mind open about learning 10 new things every day. Um, so I think that's important. What I would do differently, what I would tell my younger self would be to shut up, quite frankly. I, I think as a younger self, um, Carolyn knows me and so she's laughing. Um, but I think as my younger self and maybe even my older self, just sometimes you just have to sit back and listen um, and really just zip it and, and let, let others do the talking um, and taking a back seat for sure for me, I think would be what I'd tell my younger self. Thanks, Sherry. Damien? Yeah, I think, I think, um, I think something that I did, did right, and it was maybe by accident, <laughs> um, was I was able to take my time. Um, I think a lot of times when you're young, particularly when you're going through school, and you're trying to find your career and go to grad school or do something, you know, there's a rush, like you just need to get there, you know? And time is just a completely different concept at that age than it is like today for me. And, and I think that, you know, what seems like an eternity, you know, like a year or two or three at that time is literally nothing, you know, in the in the scheme of things. And that little extra bit of maturity, you know, that can come by just waiting a little bit or like being sure you want to do the big commitment thing, you know, can can go a long way in building your, you know, building, you know, finding, you know, finding the the right path along your journey. And oftentimes, I think, you know, folks tend to rush into things before because they it, there's this sense that you need to hurry for whatever reason and it's just the feeling and, and taking your time really can really help it really helped for me you know because you know i was you know kind of rushing into medical school after i got done with after i got done with my undergrad in part because that was the thing you do you, like that was what is you know, the pre-med and then you finish and you go to school and you just say rush off and i had followed a um a, a resident. I didn't go to the, the established doctor because usually they just everybody tells you how great their lives are. And then, but I went to a resident who just wouldn't hold back and told me what it's really like. And I was like, I better just be sure I want to do this. That's how I ended up into the into the PA program because it was only a, a couple of years. I could take a couple of years. I could always go back to medical school. It's only two years, right? If I if, if I wanted to, and I realized during that time. It was not for me. Like this is not. I mean, I can practice. I can do it, but it was not what really drove me. And that extra space allowed me to find my the new new thing and in going into the grad school. And just a just a few extra years of maturity, in my as I entered into grad school. And I was kind of a little bit behind. You know, a lot of folks who kind of rushed into school and were kind of getting done. But at the end of the day, I was just much better off because I could just handle myself. I had some life experiences. You know. And, you know, and now, you know, you were able, you were able to leverage that into a catapult into, you know, a career that has been very fruitful from, in my, in, in my view, that probably would have never happened if I, if I had taken that first school and in, in the first job or gone it off to medical school or stayed in that first job. So that's like mm. one thing that I, I think, um, I think I did right, you know, was just delay stuff a little bit to just a little more mature and you know but it said it wasn't because i was some genius and knew what, everything i wanted to do it was mostly because that kind of happened by chance you know i got I, I talked to the right people who made me rethink a little bit about my long-term mm. commitments mm. um so you know that's one thing i think you know you know what did i do wrong i mean it's hard to say i mean I, what i would say is that i you know I, I probably, 
didn't take, I didn't, you know, I didn't take my, I, you know, again, like this is probably wrong or it could be right. It depends on your personality. Like for me, I, when I was, when I was really young, I didn't take my, um, my you know, the, the academic, I mean, I was good in academics, but I didn't really take it seriously. I wasn't really learning like I probably could have. I didn't take advantage of all the opportunity, you know, and, you know, in some level it slowed me down, which helped, but at the other level, I missed out on a lot, you know, cause it wasn't paying attention, you know? So, you know, if I were to go back, I would probably would, you know, and I even think about it now, it's like, because half the time I see these students, you know, like yourselves and others, young folks come into my lab and they work and I'm like, and I try to imagine myself at their age. And I was like, oh my God, I, I, would, I, would, I was terrible. Like not even remotely, not even remotely close, you know? Um, so, you know, and, and that kind of, it's, it, it feels like I was cheated myself a little bit because I didn't, I wasn't, you know, taking full advantage of all the opportunities that were in front of me. Um, the other day it worked out, you know, which kind of speaks to my first point, but that's probably something I would rethink if I was going back, you know, all those years. Yeah, I appreciate that reflection. I look back and remember so many times I learned something to pass the class or to pass the test or to write the paper to produce the product, not to learn for the joy of learning. And I really wish I'd gone back and taken the time to learn. I, I wish I understood more processes than I understand now. I have to relearn it if I want to know something physiologically or uh, in the microbiology space. And had I learned it the first time, I, I think I'd still know it, you know, had I learned it to really know it. Um, yeah, I also like what, what you're both saying about taking time and taking that step back and listening and waiting. Uh, so many of us plunge forward to the goal and then the next goal and then the next goal. And we truly don't appreciate the journey as much as we, as we could and should. Um, interns and scholars, feel free to throw a question in the chat box. I'm gonna bring us to present day and ask a professional futuristic question. Um, I'm not a big sci-fi fan. I was a Star Trek. Uh, I would I would identify a little bit as a Trekkie, a little. Uh, but I do like to think about the future and where we'll be. And, and I think it's important for us to do that and to see how, how we're contributing um, to where we're going. So I will get to Jeanette's question. I think it's a great one. Um, but Damien and Sherry, as you think about your, your areas of expertise, what do we not know today that we need to know in, in the field? Like what, what are the questions that need to be answered or what are the technologies or innovations that we need um, that we don't currently have? Oh, well, geez, for IPE, when you talk about interprofessional care and improving outcomes for patients, that's a whole lot we need to learn, right? I think that's that's the first thing that comes to my mind. I mean, I think, you know, yeah, we want to cure lots of things in clinics in terms of patient illnesses um, that we're maybe not where we need to be in some things as well. Um, but boy, in the interprofessional space, really looking at populations and 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 showing what are the measures by which we know that team care is improving outcomes. And I think we're getting there. We're starting to have measures for that. Um, but but what is that really going to look like? Um, and boy, my 20 year from now self would love to to know what that looks like and how are we how do we get out of these silos um, when you're in a clinic and you are maybe just one or two providers in a clinic that's pretty siloed. So how do you do team care? Where's your pharmacist that you can call? What social worker can you refer these patients to? So I would just love to my future self to know more about how we're going to get um, out of the silos that we still find ourselves in and how are we going to measure the outcomes that we hope to improve patient care. And we're, we're starting to make some strides, but we've got a long way to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Sherry, I was thinking you were going to go to time travel, quantum physics, better use of nuclear. Damien? <laughs> <laughs> You went to team well, science, a core fundamental, like, yeah, yeah, thing well, that we wah, see. Wah, wah. Yeah. <laughs> well, here, here you go. So I, you know, I, you know, we do a lot of work in mental health, right? So mm -hmm. for us, we need to understand how the brain works, 
you know, and that's like pretty hard, it turns out. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I think like one of the one of the one of the areas that's probably been limiting in our ability to um, make really fast strides in our work is really trying to is really really truly kind of characterizing the what they call the variance in in the population in the brain like and we tend to do a lot of um, um, we tend to do a lot of you know kind of population studies you know to to identify markers of health which are obviously super important right if you're if the question is about population science but when it comes to treatment and care and things like that despite all the work that we do in that space it's really it has to be more about like what 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 about you makes you 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 know and that kind of understanding that individual variability in the context of the population is extremely important to zero in on something that you don't understand or don't know, like the brain. And so I think that's like a, that's a pretty that's a pretty big one, you know. Yeah. So um, you know, so there's lots of technologies around brain imaging. That's kind of my space, you know. But in and in, in a lot of other um, different types of non-invasive ways, you can understand like a personalized brain almost like a fingerprint which i think is, a, is a really it's really going to help us try to really zero in on a lot of um potentially new discoveries um but it is also going to be breaking away or kind of compartmentalizing um the way we do the work into population studies for questions that are about population stuff you know and then if it's about treatment and things like this it's got to be a little bit more personalized Actually, the, I like to give this example because people usually get it. Because in my in my previous life as a PA, I was I did a lot of cerebrovascular disease. Mm. I ran a stroke clinic, and you know I was oftentimes in the emergency room. And uh, you know we'd have folks come into the we had folks come into the ER, and they'd have like facial droop, couldn't move the side of their body, difficulty speaking, right? Mm. And you knew you knew they had a a stroke. Right, you it's everybody knew it, right? But you don't start treating them right away, mm -hmm. right? What you do is you need to put them in a scanner and figure out whether they had an ischemic stroke or do they have a hemorrhagic stroke, right? Because the way you treat those two things in, is completely opposite, mm -hmm. right? And you can imagine how long you could figure out, like to develop any new therapy or do it if you just use this outward appearance and just like these behaviors and just and you you treated them the same way every time. Like you gave them an aspirin to prevent secondary stroke. That's how you would. That's what you would do if, for an ischemic stroke. You would never know that it's helpful, right? Because half the people will get worse and half the people will get better if you did everything based on this big. So we're trying to think think through like developing technologies that we can zero in and and really characterize the individual, but how how you're conducting this task or how you're doing this thing or like what 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 the manifestations of the disorder is in you, you know, and that I think is gonna will help us push things along quite quickly, much, much more quickly than it had over the last several decades. Yeah, I appreciate that. And the imaging capabilities have gotten so amazing of late that you would be able to do some of that. I think for a lot of folks that are more applied in the real world and not in clinical research laboratories, we, we always want to hear that um, the findings are going somewhere, that are, they're being translated into practice eventually. So your points about personalization or tailoring of an intervention or a treatment is really helpful um, because otherwise you've got all those, these folks thinking, hey, I'm going to work in population health, but um, how, can I, how can I actually use what's, what's being learned about the individual brain? Um, yeah. So and I want Damien to find the cure for not really the cure, but like resilience in kids, right? How do we build that? We, we know that some kids are more resilient than others. And you talk about the you and what the individual you is in terms of mental health. But man, if there was a magic button to build resilience in kids for all these kids that have so many um, kind of strikes against them, that'd be great. Yeah. So um, let me do one quick follow up and then we've got two questions and Jeanette, if you want to ask your question, um, uh, that'll be fabulous. 
So pediatrics, you're both sort of focused on young people and intervening early. And let's set aside for a minute environment, environmental factors, chemical exposures, all the things we know that can harm people. But let's just let's just say we're intervening with kids and with young people. Is the work we're doing with adults um, useless in your perspective? Would you do you feel that we really should be targeting most of our attention toward young people, toward their environments, toward their social and structural determinants of health? Why focus on adults at all? They've made their choices. They've landed where they've landed. Uh, why not focus everything on kiddos? My quick answer is if we did that, we would never know about the ACEs, right? The adverse childhood events and the outcomes that lead to that, right? So that came from the adult studies, right, of kids. And then you looked back and found out, wow, if they have all these adverse childhood events, um, look what can happen. Um, so these things happen in childhood, but we studied adults. So, right, if we never studied adults, we wouldn't have this head start on, okay, we know that kids are living in these situations. We need to pay more attention to get them into therapies, get them into services, um, get some connections for the family. So I'm um, sure in my pediatric world, I'd like to say, let's invest all our time and money in kids. But I know that there's a lot of learning that happens in the adult space that is helping our kids. Yeah. Yeah, I would say it's not, I would say it's not really an either or, you mm -hmm. know, that there are, um, there are a lot, you know, a lot of what we learned that are either adult only, or they manifest in adulthood, or they have nothing to do with your development as a, as a, as a child, you know, like in some cases, not always like, you know, or, you know, so there's a lot of things that you, 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 there are clear um, um, discoveries of things that we should be, you know, searching for in adults. I would say though, that the, the proportion of focus that has been an adult in a lot of our, our a lot of our basic research is probably is probably not weighted correctly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the you know be, and, it, and it's because you know that you're right that there are the the optimal time you know for a lot of you know intervention and trying to understand all is way 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 earlier. You know, in our case, like. You know, you know, almost all, and it's even earlier than even birth. Like, I mean, almost all the neurons you're gonna ever have in your for your entire life, ever, are are they they're born, they're put in place, you know, and they're like final resting place by the time you're essentially like six months old, right? And then from there, you know, you know, the the brain essentially is a massive amounts of of um, of connections that are born out of those those are neurons that kind of peak at around two and then and then after that it's just kind of sculpting away the sculpture right and over time you lose the capability you don't lose the capability it becomes harder to change any atypical trajectories and things like that particularly with the brain um so the optimal time for intervention is early and we just we don't invest as nearly as much as we do with these later periods which is probably not weighted correctly considering the optimal opportunities you have at these younger ages. Um, so that's like one thing I would say, I mean, we know today, even, I mean, even in, I mean, look at how we invest in, in childhood, you know, right now, you know, if you take, if you, if you, if you kind of, if you look at weight, the, the importance of the specific time periods and specific critical periods and when they occur, relative to when we start spending dollars like in our society on, you know, on, on child um, care and health and education and everything, we're past like a lot of those periods, right? Yeah. Starts in the, essentially in kindergarten, right? That's essentially when we start spending money, right? But like those, that long period, those first 1,000 days, those first few years are extremely important in getting you on, a, on the right path. There's some estimates, right, that if we even swapped the money that you spend in for high school, right, and put that all in the first four years instead that, you know, these kids would be way, a lot of the kids times the kids would be way better off long term, you know. 
So like, it's not really an either or, and that's obviously just a drastic, you know, this yeah, discussion. Yeah. But I do think that, um, that there, it, 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 there's a big shift in the waiting um, would, be, would be potentially important. It's very difficult to do because it's not as, it's, it's harder, it's like, who are you convincing, right? And it's really, it's the, it's the policy, it's people who are do, generating policy and putting where all the money is, right? And it's not easy to argue that putting a lots of money in otherwise healthy kids, you know, who, you know, kids in general are, have, are just healthier than you are when you're older, right? So cancers and, and, and cog- various type forms of cognitive decline, Parkinson's, you know, Alzheimer's, that's really palpable. You can see it, you know, you can feel it. You understand what it means. It's very right there. And so a lot of our, a lot of investments go into the things that are easy to pitch, you know, and it, all that stuff's super important, but you could probably make the argument, you know, even now, like some of these, some of these orders of cognitive decline, they start that early, you know? So, you know, there's, you know, probably waiting some more investment as, as these early stages would probably benefit society in a great way. It's hard to put a number on it, which is why it's hard to move the needle because we get, you know, we get, it's kind of sucked in the way that we've been doing things always, right? But um, I do think, you know, this is opinion with a little bit of data that moving, you know, moving um, some of those distributions, how we just, dis- you know, distribute those dollars would probably be, would probably be helpful to move towards younger ages. Yeah, and it would be a much longer conversation, but looking at public health and public policy and just the political decision-making that goes behind funding early childhood education programs, nurse family partnership programs, these aren't, these aren't magic, unicorn magic bullet things, but they have some pretty long decades of research to show that they have helped uh, quite a bit. But a lot of resources to certain populations and then to other populations, there's just, it becomes political and argumentative and and not bipartisan um, too. Yeah, it's it's a very difficult space, Mm -hmm. but this is when you guys start talking policy, it becomes, it's hard because this is, I was looking at some of the, one of the questions was on soft skills, you know, for your, for your roles. Yeah. And and that's one of them, you know, is com- how to communicate, how to write and communicate, right? Um, because it's so important for public health, right? Mm-hmm. Your ability to tell a story is, you know, worth your, you know, worth, worth its weight in gold, right? Because um, that's actually how things get done. It's how our brains are made up. They're built to hear stories, you know, and... The folks who can tell good stories typically get what they want, you know? (laughs) And so, you know, those are some of the things that, you know, that, you know, you've learned over time. The problem is, of course, is that oftentimes, um, depending on what field you're in or what you're doing, it's not, it's not, it's not a focus of your education, right? You're learning it from a good mentor or from a good colleague, you know, there's teaching you stuff, you know, you get put in the right environments, you know? but it's not typically like the focus of your ed, despite its level of importance. So, you know, that, that's one of, the, one of the things I encourage everybody to practice because it doesn't always come natural. You have to practice. It's just like any other, it's just like any other skill, right? You need to get in front of people. You need to try to tell your story. You need to, you know, take those opportunities. Like I used to always say, say yes. You know, when somebody asks you to do something like that, because you know, that will drive, you know, a lot of your, a lot of success later on um, as you move along in your career, because that, that ability to communicate, really tell a story, both verbally and writtenly, it is just humongous. I think the other soft skill that's really important, you talk about communication for sure, um, but then just the listening part, right? And the soft skill of building relationships. So the other people that get things done are the people that have built relationships and, you know, kind of you're the nice guy on the team and people really want to um, they gravitate towards you, right? And, and and you can help move things along in a quiet way, I think sometimes. And so how do you tell the stories and then how do you listen to other people's stories in a way um, that this relationship nurtures along to, to make policy changes? And um, and so I think those I think those are both really soft skills and they're super important to to share the stories for sure. Yeah. 
Definitely. Jeanette, do you have a follow-up or to that? No, that answers that. Thank you. Great. Angela, do you want to ask your question? Sure. Thank you. Thank you for both for sharing. I was interested because both of you mentioned learning either at an earlier stage of your career or currently. And I'm wondering how do you continue to grow your knowledge in your respective fields? The great question. And I can tell you, I, you know, Carolyn mentioned earlier this. Um, the, the ongoing learning and how she wished when she was younger that you, when you go through college, that you're there to really just soak it all in. We tell that to our students all the time, just take advantage you're here and just learn and don't just think like, I, I need this grade or I need this paper, but just really like learning. And I think that if you carry that with you throughout your career, then you, you want to learn those 10 new things. That's just something that I've always told myself, 10 new things every day. You just want to learn those new things every day because you just love to learn and you're just um, soaking up new knowledge in which ways you can and, and, and find, I find it fascinating when like, oh, wow, I didn't know that. Or, oh, that's really neat how that happens. Um, and so giving yourself time, I think is one thing to do. Um, you have to give yourself time to do that, whether it's, um, in the morning, afternoon, taking an hour over lunch where you're just kind of absorbing. I have many email listers that I'm on in terms of pediatric care, um, in terms of interprofessional care, um, where I get tidbits uh, every day, just, dumped into my email that I can read a quick summary. Um, yes, there's journal articles and sub subscribing to those and reading what's happening in the, in the ev evidence and what's the literature saying around the topic that you're interested in. But I think having these snippets that come in your email um, as a quick read, five minute YouTube videos, um, just really always being open to that and, and uh, lots and lots of reading. Yeah, I, on my end, I, I I agree with all that. I mean, I, um, you know, part of my job is learning new things, right? So that's we you know that's that's the beauty. That's why I do what I do because it's, it's every single day it's something new. You're supposed to figure out something that no one's ever thought of ever before. <laughs> like, you know, that's what we do every day, you know. But I would say that no pressure, Damien. No pressure. Yeah, <laughs> you know. But I would say that, um, you know particularly when I'm moving into a new space, you know, like, like I said, I'm, I'm trained as a neuroscientist, but now I'm doing all types of administration and, um, you mm. know, pol you know, policy work and things that I'd never even imagined that I probably would be doing um, even just five or six years ago. And one of the, one of the things that, and it, it, a lot of this depends on your personality, right? Is that, you know, everybody's got their own personality, about how they learn best, um, and so almost nothing that I, almost nothing that I can say is, is guaranteed to, to help you because you're, you, it's, you know, uh, part of maturing is understanding, you know, you, you, your strengths and weakness, who you are. So you, you can begin to strategize your, the, the optimal cases, you know, for you to learn. But for me, I can tell you that, um, I, I don't, I don't learn like, taking doing classes I don't learn like if I very well I don't learn if I'm if I'm like if I I, I need to build up on my statistics for example like math is a big one is a big one and stats right because everybody wants everybody's got to learn the stats you know I really learn and really hold it in when it's part of a task you know so like you know if I have to figure x out and I need some new special statistics to get it get there then it will sink it will sink in because i will do it it will be for a purpose i'll understand why i'm doing it and that particular method or that particular thing is part of that outcome right and that's usually for me how things stick you know so you know i whenever i i'm starting um starting folks in the lab on a new project because i need to learn a new skill set or if even for myself, if I'm if I'm you know wanting to move in another direction and I, because I need to learn something new, I'll I'll set some goal or some product you know that will be at the end, even if it's like a, a paper or something you know that I that I need to I'm trying to complete. Where along the way, you'll learn that task. In fact, I just did it for one of the new 
um, folks who started in the lab is engineering, where he needed to learn this new, this new database, you know, system that we have, you know. And so I gave him a task. I said, okay, you, you know, what your task is, you need to you need to take a bunch of numbers out of that database, you know, put, you know, randomize them in a specific way and put them in this other, put them in this other database. And by doing that, he's the only way he can possibly do that task is if he learns the specific elements of the database he's in to be able to do it, you know, and that's when things for me usually kind of stick. And that's usually how I, I, I try to help other people learn things that I need them to learn is kind of put, putting them inside specific tasks and less so about doing taking the core, the online course or doing the, you know, or, you know, signing up for the next class, but really kind of putting it along the path of success, you know? So that's just something to think about. It's my style. It's not for everybody. I can tell you that, but, but that's, you know, uh, how I think about it. Yeah. I appreciate those, uh, those responses a lot. You'll never be completely on top of your field or your literature all the time. But there are things you can do to absorb digests or to set up filters that send you certain things. And I would, I would also encourage you to remember that if you are trying to generate a new idea or think about the next thing that no one else has ever thought of, get yourself into a completely different space to learn something new and then come back to that topic you're passionate about. So an example um, that I can give from my own life is recently I had a friend teach me how to solder. I had never soldered anything before. I had never touched that equipment and I messed up a lot, but I learned. And, um, you know, sometimes it's just like you have to get yourself out of your own element for a little while and then you can come back to the, to the work or the, the field of study or whatever that task is in front of you as well. So don't be afraid to diversify up a little bit. Um, okay, I want to ask this question. The, the interns do always appreciate hearing from, um, from you with respect to podcasts that you enjoy, books that you might have read recently, uh, particular music that you enjoy, um, a movie or an art, something that has challenged you recently. So any... Um, any recommendations you have, we're, we're compiling a list and we, we share these with the scholars uh, frequently. And they don't have to be on topic, but um, they, you know, they can also be fun ones. Well, I could talk about books all day long because I love to read. Um, and I did do this because I know it was a question, but this literally sits on my desk. If you don't know, the boy, the mole and the fox. Okay, it's... <laughs> Um, near and dear to my heart. It's a children's book, but if you don't have it, you should, you should have it. Um, not just for the littles in your life, but for you to read. For example, the little boy says, nothing beats kindness, said the horse. It sits quietly beyond all things. The artwork is great. The messages are good. Um, it's a really great book. Um, I buy it in bulk and give it to people. Um, <laughs> so that just happens to be sitting on my desk, but um, I am an avid reader and um, there's just so many good things to read, whether they're fiction or not fiction. I recently, um, I'm in a book club with some university school nursing colleagues and we just finished reading um, The Midnight Library. It's been 11, a long time on the New York bestseller list um, and it's nonfiction talking about um, regrets, um, really good. Um, but classics, right, that I read recently, Atul Gawande being mortal, everyone should read that, especially if you're in healthcare. Um, Edith Egger, E-G-E-R, The Gift, um, how you really find um, happiness and joy in the most difficult situation. She's a Holocaust survivor and um, psychologist, 90 some years old. She's got just a great message. Um, and then, you know, things like Amy Edmondson's psychological safety and creating psychologically safe spaces. So I can read anything all over the gamut. Um, I go to the movie every Friday night with my husband. We have Friday night movie nights. Um, we, we rarely miss. Um, recently saw the new best picture for um, CODA. If you haven't seen it, highly recommend that. Um, so yeah, I could talk books, movies, and podcasts all day. <laughs> Damien, how about you? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I 
it's funny that like, I'm so busy these days. I, I don't read as much as I probably should. But there's a, a few books that I, you know, that have kind of touched me over the years because they taught me something, you know, about, you know, that I kind of took to heart along my along my journey, right? So one is one is this book by this physicist Richard Feynman, you know, about what what do you care what others think, you know, and it's a really it was a really kind of salient book for me when I was young about that helped me think through what my one of my original mentors say that like confidence and competence so like how to be confident about you know who you are you know not cocky but confident in a in a be competent about how you go about your business like being very strategic about how you you know you you navigate through life and like that's kind of stuck with me over the years um it has stuck me through the years and I've kind of carried that with me today because it's a really important um, you know, lesson to learn about how to maximize your potential. Um, another book that I, this is one of my, it relates to what I was telling you earlier that I, I carry around with me. I often give it to my students. It's this elements of style, you know, and it's a, it's yeah. a, it's a, it, it's a book that essentially you can hang on to help you, be a good writer, you know, and there you go. <laughs> um, um, and uh, in another book that I that I think is kind of salient for today's time, and particularly here in Minnesota, here is this um, um, is a book by James McBride called *The Color of Water*. Mm. Um, it's about this um, uh, black. Uh, man and his white Jewish mother who talk about um, race and culture and environments. And it's a really powerful book in our time. And I think, um, and, and for me in many ways of trying to navigate um, academia and just life in general and, and, and thinking through about how to approach um, difficult situations and things like that. So it's another book that I kind of taken to heart over the years and kind of kind of put in my my back pocket about, you know, to think about how I how I kind of continue on my own journey. Thank you. Thank you for those recommendations. Um, let's do a closing comment from each of you when the world is feeling so big. How do you make it small? Or when problems. Can you repeat that one more time? Sure. So, when the world is feeling so big, when problems are feeling so big, how do you how do you make it small, manageable, approachable? Relationships with the people around you. Just just connecting with those that are in your space and, and having meaningful relationships, whether it's professional or personal, but I think that makes the big world seem less big and scary when you just know who your people are, um, both in your professional world and your personal world, just those meaningful, really, truly meaningful relationships. That's my quick answer. Yeah, thanks, Sherry. Yeah, I, I agree, you know, like your community is, is your hideaway, <laughs> you know, and um, being close to your community, I think, is really important. I also think that, you know, is kind of understanding your, your own limits and being able to, this is part of the strategy part, right? And being able to prioritize what's most meaningful for you. Mm. Um, and that can help, you know, it doesn't make the world any, any smaller, but it helps you along the stairway, right? Where you're taking steps of, you know, um, you know, one at a time instead of trying to jump the entire length of the stairway, right? Yeah. Um, so, and that's not always easy because, particularly when you're young, because you want to do everything, you know, or <laughs> or or if you're if you find yourself in a in a space like I do often, where you you're doing a career or having a job where you enjoy so much, right? You end up tackling more than you than you can even imagine so kind of stepping back strategizing and thinking about what and prioritizing 
what what's most meaningful for you, I think, can to help you uh, manage a world that's that big. Thank you. Thank you both, Sherry and Damien, for the conversation today. It's been it's been fun. It's been great.